now that I've been preaching, you know, now as the associate pastor for nearly a year and a half, but also filling in some before then. But th- there's a part of that that I don't always include and don't always share because it's it's not necessarily the moment that I came to Christ or the moment that I had my call to ministry. But, you know, I, I have gone to this church nearly my whole life. I, I started out going every Sunday with my grandmother, and then the contemporary service was new. My aunt starts playing the piano there. And so my parents moved to the contemporary service, and I start going with them. And that was before the turn of the century, and like what happens sometimes, I didn't make the jump from children's to youth, and so 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, I, I didn't come to church on a single Wednesday night, and then, um, I, you know, in 6th grade, I took band as an elective, wanted to be a drummer, and uh, by ninth grade, I, I was better than I was when I first started, I'll say that, I don't know how good I would have classified myself as, but, but one evening, I got a phone call from Warren Jones, and said, hey, I need a drummer for my youth praise band. What do you do on Wednesday nights? And I was, I'm, like, I'm talking about excited. I was like, somebody wants me to come in and be their drummer. Like, this is fantastic. And I said, well, you know, normally we go to San Pedro every Wednesday night and because, and, you know, they got the buffet. That's just what my family does. So I came and uh, became a part of the praise team for the youth and uh, made one week, skipped the next because... <laughs> It just, practice didn't go the way I was used to rehearsals going because, you know, Gerald Bailey was my band director. And so the next week I didn't show up and Warren calls me and, you know, in short, he convinces me, hey, get, give it one more week. And then if, and if it's still not for you, that, that's fine. No pressure. And I said, I, I'll do one more week. And then I did every week after that. You know, the Holy Spirit somehow got that hook in me and, and I stayed. So this one phone call, with a necessary follow-up because I didn't show up the next week. But this, this one little act of, hey, I'm desperate for a drummer. This guy's a member of our church and drums. Let me, let me call him. I can guarantee you Warren had no idea that nine years later I would answer a call to ministry. Ten years later I would come on staff. Eleven years later I would be the youth pastor of the very youth group that he invited me to. And then, just shy of 14 years later, I would become the associate pastor at that church. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I didn't know that either, because if I had, I can't tell you that I would have showed up to try to be their drummer. Now, I love being here, and I love where I'm at, but I can tell you, if you told ninth grade me, hey, you're going to get up in front of a congregation every Sunday and preach God's Word, I'd have said, I will be at San Pedro on Wednesday night. (laughs) So, I don't regret it, but I am thankful that God can take small, seemingly insignificant things and work wonders. Now that is a perfect lead-in to our parable because that is exactly what we're going to talk about. And if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 13, we're going to be in verses 31 and 32. We're continuing with the parables uh, we, we skipped over one sermon-wise, but you would have read it, I'm sure. And we come to, again, another parable involving seed and a sower and a plant. So I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Hear the reading of the Word. He, being Jesus, put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you and we love you and thank you for your word. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit, as we walk through this uh, two-verse parable, Lord, that you would come and, and open our eyes and ears, Lord, to your word. God, not only in its proper context to the audience, but but to what you would have it do and work in us this morning. So, Father, we do pray for ears to hear and a heart to understand that Jesus would be glorified. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is like. And this is where we get one of those extended similes rather than one of the longer stories. When that's where we are clued in by that, where he says, is like. Of which the kingdom of heaven is the focus. 
Now, we don't have as many elements and players as we had in the parable of the four soils from last week. We've still got a few, but we have to launch into this from the context and understanding that Jesus is focusing on the kingdom of heaven. When we read the rest of the parable, it is to explain the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like. This is to use an earthly thing to explain God's heavenly kingdom. So let's walk through and we get uh, through the first sentence. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man. Well, well who's the man? In the first parable that you find in Matthew 13, which we said is the first parable recorded in each of the synoptic gospels, that is kind of the launch pad into all of the parables, Jesus is the sower. And the hearts of the crowd are the soil. And he says the seed is the word of God. So we've got Jesus as the sower. And then in the second parable, the one that we jumped over, Jesus is the sower of good seed, and Satan is the enemy that is sowing the bad seed. And we get that because later on, Jesus that explains that parable as well in verses 37 through 39. And in the third, I think we're safe in following the pattern that Jesus is the man who takes the seed and sows. Now, of the three parables with a sower and a seed, this is the one for which we don't get an explanation. Now, what we can't do is lift this one out of context. Now, Matthew 13, 1 through 3 tells us that Jesus is by the Sea of Galilee. He's preaching and teaching, and these massive crowds are flocking to him. As I was coming across the Warrington Causeway coming into town early this morning, I looked over to my right, and look, I get them mixed up sometimes. It's bad. But I looked over to my right. And I looked at the rec center, and you've got the senior center, and and from what I've read about uh, this region, it would look kind of similar. Galilee is this, or the Sea of Galilee is this giant lake, and then you've got these mountains on both sides, but when it comes down, there's this flat area. And I I was thinking, you know, Jesus could get in a boat and come right offshore, and, and the crowd could gather right behind the senior center, and we would be okay there, but if you go much further away from the shore, whoop, You've got two big mountains. And so that's kind of, it's not going to be exactly the same, but it was a, I I couldn't help but take note as I was coming in this morning. So we've got the same crowd as Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, when Jesus begins his teaching. It's the same crowd, it's the same place, and all of these are helping to explain to those who have ears to hear the kingdom of heaven. All three parables have Jesus as the sower of good seed. And then we come to the man took and sowed. So the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that the man took and sowed in his field. Now the Greek word for took is labon. Now a lot of the time when we come to receive Holy Communion, and especially when I'm teaching this in confirmation and, and serving communion to confirmands when we get to that lesson, I, I tell them that the way that we approach, whether it's at the altar here or even if it's coming in line like over in the, the contemporary service, we come with our hands out like this as a sign that, that the Lord's grace is received, not taken. That's not what we're talking about here. The word Laban has this assertive connotation. It's an active verb that denotes intentionality, something that we mentioned last week. It's not just this farmer who's haphazardly sowing, he's intentionally sowing. The same is true for here, and the same is true of the kingdom of heaven. There is intentionality. The mustard seed didn't jump in there by mistake. It wasn't sown by mistake. The man intentionally took, and the man intentionally sowed. And what do we read about the seed? It's the smallest of all seeds. And right here is where we get to where people have a major objection. Because it's not the smallest of all seeds. There are seeds that are smaller. Now, Jesus is speaking in the proverbial sense. If, if we get hung up on whether or not the mustard seed is literally the smallest seed, we have missed the point. Can't see the forest for the trees would be an appropriate saying in that moment. The Greek word 
is mikroteron. That prefix we'll recognize. You translate it, go through history, and we get our word micro. So we know it means small, but when we look at the definition, it means small and little. And in my study and research, I find that it's in the NASB it's translated once as smallest. Uh, the King James actually translate it, translates it as the least, which is one of the ways in which this word can be translated. So I just the point being, whether it's the smallest, a small one, the smallest one you might plant in a garden, whatever the case, Knox will tell you, it's small. Right? We, we get the point. It is tiny. The emphasis is not that it is the smallest. The emphasis is that it is seemingly insignificant. In my notes, I've got a big star by that because that's important. The emphasis is not whether it's literally the smallest seed or not. The emphasis is that it is seemingly insignificant. And then we get but. So we see it is the smallest of seeds, but when it has grown. There's a reason that Jesus chooses the mustard seed. Because again, there were smaller seeds He could have chosen. But this seemingly insignificant seed has a capacity for growth that is worthy of a but in this parable. Yes, it is small, but when it has grown. There is a stark contrast between the perceived significance of this tiny seed to its capacity for growth. This is because, or this is key, because the parable is explaining what? The kingdom of heaven. He's using a mustard seed. The parable is not about the mustard seed. The parable is about the kingdom of heaven. And he's using the mustard seed because of its stark contrast between its perceived significance and its capacity for growth. And then he says, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. Now, I love a good inside joke. Unless I'm on the outside. Then it's no fun. right? It's no fun to be on the outside of an inside joke. Most of the time, to be inside a joke. How, how many times have we been and had this happen in real life? I know we've seen it in movies. But the, there will be an inside joke and one person is left out and they're really wanting to know what happens. And the people on the inside say what? You just had to be there. Exactly. In other words... There's a context that you are missing. Now, had we been here in this original audience, we would have already the context that we miss unless we truly dive in and study the historical and cultural context. And the exact same is true with the mustard seed. Again, the parable is not about the mustard seed or the tree that it becomes. It's about the kingdom of heaven, but it's a good example. And people do get hung up here. One, because, as we said, it's technically not the smallest of seeds. But also because the mustard that we know, unless you just happen like me to accidentally plant one and leave it alone because you don't want to eat it anyway, is just a little shrubby green looking thing that we pluck. Never gets taller than about a foot, foot and a half. If you, before then, most people remember, oh yeah, I need to go out and pick these. But Jesus found ways in everyday life to turn them into teachable moments. I stole that from Jonathan Watts. I'll give him credit. He says that all the time. Jesus found ways to make teachable moments out of everyday things. Now, it's possible and, and I would say probable that there was literally a farmer off in the distance or nearby that was sowing seed when Jesus told this parable. And, and perhaps the crowd could see it. Maybe so, maybe not. It's incredibly likely that when Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, that the crowd could see mustard. Now, there's two options. Two options, two types of mustard in Israel that it could have been. One of them is more closely related to what the, what the mustard seeds that I have in my pocket, or I guess they're over there now, would become if you do what I did, you plant it, you leave it alone. They look they look very similar. They grow up to be about the same height, somewhere between you know five and seven feet tall. 
leaves would get really big, but it, it, it looks more bushy than, than more like a tree. The second option, which I think is, is maybe more so the, the route that it, or the, the correct option that it would have been in that time, is now referred to as the tobacco tree. But back then it was called a mustard tree. And this one, with the seeds incredibly small, just like the ones I had in that bag and the one that I gave to Knox, grows up to be like 10 plus feet tall. And it has a stem that looks barky. It looks like a small tree. But compared to the size of the seed, because I, I saw a, a pastor had taken a trip to the Holy Land and he uh, had a picture of he had broken up, open one of the pods and poured them into his hand and what looked like a tiny dot was like a hundred of these seeds. And so most people think this is what Jesus was talking about. But see, the thing is, again... It, either way, it doesn't matter. The point is, really small seed it grows into a surprisingly tall and big tree or plant, whatever we want to call it. Let, let's, let's rephrase this and put it into terms and just set the mustard seed aside. The kingdom of heaven is like something seemingly insignificant with a massive capacity for growth. Now let's bring it home and how I believe Jesus wanted them to understand it. And when I say home, I don't mean, hey, we're going to get out of here early. I still got three pages to go of notes. So I, don't, I didn't mean bring it home like that. But again, bring it home just in the terms of how I believe Jesus wanted the original audience to understand it. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Jesus has been baptized he, by John the Baptist. He has been anointed with the Holy Spirit. Heaven is opened up. God has said, yep. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus has gone out into the desert. He's been tempted. And he comes back. And it is time to begin his public ministry. And like the good Bible-knowing, church-going people that we are, Jesus' first words were what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus announces his public ministry by saying the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, the Jewish people, they have longed for this. They've longed for this. They were, and for those that missed it, I guess still are, anticipating the coming of the Messiah and the coming of the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus announces His public ministry in this way, they would have been, hang on a minute, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, let's go, I'm excited. But, what did they think? the kingdom of heaven coming near would actually look like. We talked about this uh, either last week or week before, maybe both, I don't know. But they thought the Messiah is going to come in on a white horse, he's going to have a sword, he's going to be decked out. Hey, he's coming, the kingdom of heaven is coming, and they're going to kick the Romans out of here, and he's going to free the people of Israel from oppression. Well, I'd call that significant. If that had been the way the Messiah came in, that would be a significant moment. And it's, again, what the people were expecting. It's no doubt that many of the people in the crowds, even as we're in Matthew chapter 13 and we're just getting the parables, and Jesus is in Galilee by the coast teaching, many of the people flocking to Him would have been looking for that Messiah. The Messiah that's going to get the Romans out of here. But, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Jesus says, oh yeah, the, the kingdom, of hand, or of, kingdom of heaven is at hand. But, rather than ride in on a white horse, I, I'm going to ride in on a donkey. Je Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, but rather than kill the Romans, I'm going to let them kill me. So now let me ask, do, do you see it? Do you have ears to hear? Another point, just, just so you know that I have a star beside. Many people miss the greatest move of God because of its perceived insignificance. Say that again. Many people missed the greatest move of God because of its perceived insignificance. Now we know, we're Easter people, we're on the back side of the story we're post-resurrection. We know it was incredibly significant. But they didn't perceive it to be that way because it's not what they thought 
Jesus was going to come do, and it's not what they wanted Jesus to come do. Now, as I chewed on that, I'll be honest with you, I began to reflect back. I went all the way back to creation. And as I thought about it, I said I went and, and read a little bit about the Greek mythology's version of the creation. And I mean, you, you've got gods appearing, gods having relationships, gods at war, and I mean, it's a it's a big to do. And then I thought, okay, well, this is what science says. Their theory is what well, was the Big Bang. And, and all of the, the matter of the universe was compressed into this super little tiny fireball the size of a dot on the page. And then there was a, an explosion the likes that we can't even comprehend and matter went into flying into existence and multiplied and just shot light years. Of course, my question is, where did the matter that formed the little tiny fireball come from? But I digress. It, it's, a, it's a major event. We stick the word big in there. We call it the Big Bang. And then I look at Genesis 1. And I'm thinking, okay, so God, through divine inspiration, uh, and, and most people believe it's Moses, says, all right, I want you to write the first five books, and, and we're going to begin with the creation story. And we get, and God said. And God said. And then I, I, I thought about 1 Kings 19, where we find Elijah. He uh Hey, by the way, Elijah is tired, he is done, and he has run away. And an angel comes to him, and, you know, after a snack and a nap, then the Lord speaks to him. And we come to what I've marked here, verses 11 and 12. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart. And shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper. And that's when the Lord speaks. The one that, I'm just going to be honest with you, with, with my, my brain and my thoughts that I would deem the most insignificant, that's where God comes. Not in the massive wind that rips mountains apart, not in the earthquake or the fire, but He's in the gentle whisper. And then we'll bring it to the New Testament. And just think about the birth of the Messiah. Born among animals and laid in a feed trough. That's a story of the coming of the Messiah of which the first word we might use to describe it might be insignificant. That's not how I would just dream up, had I never read Scripture, that the Messiah came, born with that animals and laid in a feed trough. Now God's ways are not our ways, His thoughts are not our thoughts, and to that we say, thank God and amen. God is certainly all-powerful, He is magnificent and sovereign. And yet, God has a pretty good track record that spans thousands of years that we know of, of working in a way that we might deem in our own perception to be insignificant, because that's not how we would do it. E even today, how many moves of God do we miss? It's easy to look at our culture and questions well up. God, where are you? I, what are you doing? Because I, I don't see you moving at all. Now, of course, then the question is, is God not moving? Or is God not moving how we want God to move? Is God not moving? Or are we not perceiving? Now, I've shared a lot several years ago. God took me to Isaiah and, and, and took me to the verses that say, Behold, I am doing a new thing, even now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? And I've told you that, that for a while I didn't, and I still don't understand the whole aspect of it. Someday we'll be on the other side of, of what this new thing is, and then I'll be able to tell you. But when it came to the pandemic and disaffiliation and, and all the things we've walked through, I even throw the bed bugs into that mix. They're gone now for anybody watching online or listening. They're, we dealt with that a long time ago. It's not a problem. 
but I still throw it into this mix. Because I promise you, I said, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? Sometimes that we need to we need to remind ourselves and preach to ourselves that we may not perceive it, we may not understand it, it may not be what we would do if we were him. Boy, would we mess that up. That does not mean God is not moving and working. That's why I love the song Waymaker. Even when I don't see it, you're working. I have to remind myself, I, I, I may not see it. I may not even be looking in the right spot. But that doesn't mean God is not moving. I'll, I'll, I'll close with, with one more point. And this time I, I do mean bring it home because I'm out of notes. Earlier we talked about that Jesus took those, those everyday moments and turned them into teachable moments. And we said it's incredibly likely that whichever plant it was, that the people would have been able to lay their eyes on the mustard plant. Now, a, a pastor, the same one that I, had, that I saw that had the seed in his hands, on his trip to Israel, they have a picture of he and their crew walking through the, the shorter of the two options. And he's got pictures and he said, this stuff in the springtime is everywhere. He says it takes over the mountainside. And he, he told a story about he, he wanted to smuggle some of it back in to the U.S. But on his declaration sheet, he, you know, they asked, are you bringing back any seed, any soil, da 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 And he declared it, and so they gets to go talk and, you know, have a conversation when they get off the plane. And um, the, the, he said he had brought back a couple of different things. And, and he said, they let me keep everything but the mustard seed. And the guy was like, well, you know, I... At least I got to keep all this, but you know, the, the, the customs agent uh, told him, he said, I can't let you keep this because if it gets into our soil here, it will grow like wildfire. Now, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Something that many people that were there in the present time to experience when the kingdom of heaven came to earth, missed it because they deemed it to be insignificant. And yet, it has grown like wildfire. 120 people at the moment of Jesus' ascension. And now, those that claim the name of Jesus are in the billions. If we will be faithful to do what God is calling us to do, whether we perceive it to be significant or not, I promise you, the kingdom of heaven will spread like wildfire. Amen? Amen. Amen.